I, I first understood the problem when I was in second grade and I didn't have the language, but when I was in second grade, they put in a subdivision right next to where I lived. And I remember thinking, where will the garter snakes go? And where will the grasshoppers go? And where will the meadowlarks go? That's the language I did have. The language I didn't have is you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And so someday, all of my work can be summed up by someday this culture will end. And when it ends, I would rather that there's more of the world left rather than less. Mm -hmm. really happy to be talking to Derek Jensen today and Derek has written what, 27 books on environmental themes since 1995 and the last one which I want to be talking about today which you co-wrote with Keith Lear and Max Wilbert, Bright Green Lies, How the Environmental Movement Lost Its Way and What We Can Do About It, um, really uh, has made quite a big impact and certainly being exposed to your point of view Derek has made me look at the world a slightly different way. I think you look at the world from the point of view of nature in a, in a way that exposes in my world how I don't do that to the extent that you do. So, so welcome. Oh, well, thank you so much for saying that. And thank you for having me. Yeah. So let's just jump right in um, to Bright Green Lies because you talk about the lies of the, the solar movement, hydropower, um, uh, green energy storage, you know, green cities, you go through them all and talk about how none of them are going to help us. And I, I thought, let's just jump right in there. Like, what are the bright green lies and how are, you know, for instance, solar power, like so many people put a lot of hope in solar power. What's the lie underneath this? Well, the, the, the fundamental lie underneath all of it is that you can have you can consume the planet and live on it. And we see evidence of the inability to do that everywhere around us. You know, the, the oceans are collapsing, um, insect populations are collapsing, forests are either collapsing or have been cut, grasslands are collapsing or have been, been plowed. Um, biodiversity is completely crashing. I mean, just think about it for a moment. If, if you can't, Animals can't survive without habitat and plants can't survive without habitat. And when you convert that habitat to human use, somebody is harmed. Somebody already lives there. And so that's, that's the lie that, under, that underlies it all. And the, um, another, another part of the way to approach this is that um, and the, the way this book really started was 10 or 11 or 12 years ago, I was asked to do a debate with somebody who was called a bright green. And he believed that industrial civilization can be, is inherently sustainable and can be basically just tweaked. And we can make some small changes we can have and, and making those small changes, things will be fine. And when I agreed to do the interview, I told him and the moderator that I would only do it written. I wouldn't do it over the phone, like, like you and I are discussing now. And I didn't tell them why, but the, the reason was that I knew that the other person was going to lie. And I, I didn't know, you know, it's much easier to make lies than it is to defend against them because you don't know what lies are going to tell. So you have to be prepared for like every single one. And I knew that I, I couldn't do that. And, but if it's in writing, if he tells a lie, then I can do 10 minutes of research. So we're, we, we start to do it by, by written. And then he, he backs out and they convinced me to do it by, by telephone. And it went exactly as I thought, which is why it never got published anywhere. It went exactly as I thought it would. And partway through, he was saying that it is possible to have a society that is very close to what we have right now with 100% recycling 
And well, back up a little bit. At one point, he said that cities can be sustainable. And I said, where do you get the metals? Where do you get the bricks? Where do you get, where do you get the materials for cities? And he said, well, you can have 100% recycling. And I knew that wasn't true, but at the time I didn't have those figures in my head. So it took me about 10 minutes of research afterwards to, and I still don't have the numbers, but basically copper, for example, is, is pretty highly recycled, but only, I don't know what the number is, 40% of all the copper that is used every year comes from recycling because there's so much demand for new copper. So in order to have 100% recycling, you would have to have a very much collapsing economy because the, the demand for copper would have to be going down every year. And then the same is true for steel, same is true for aluminum. Plus many of those, if you make a, an alloy, it's incredibly expensive, energy intensive to, to break it apart, to, to uh, recycling steel is an incredibly toxic energy intensive process. It's not just some magic thing that happens. And so that interview never, or that, that exchange never went anywhere, never got published because I was so mad. And then I was so mad that I wrote a book because it seemed to me that this was just, that the idea of recycling by itself, making things somehow sustainable was just one of many. And so then, you know, we can go through various of the, of the, the lies, but then what we did is we did, we, me and Leah and Max decided to uh, just take them systematically, go through what's wrong with solar, what's wrong with wind and actually do the math. And all we did in many ways is sort of a supply, supply side examination you know, solar panels are not pulled from the solar fruit tree in the fall. They come from somewhere, they require mining, that mining is going to destroy someone else's home and it's going to then require the entire transportation system that we have. So, so that's sort of an overview of how we started and I can keep going, but it, 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 if you would rather, you know, if you want to ask me a specific lie, I can I can then dive into you know solar, wind, or yes, whatever. Well, let's, but that's let's the go. sort of story. I, yeah. No, I, I I you know I get it, and and I think if we pick one area, it kind of um, ripples out and covers everything in a way. It's the same story. I mean, yeah. In the, the and your book, incidentally, um, is also a documentary created by Julia Barnes, which is excellent documentary. And um, so people sometimes ask me if I have any hope or optimism. And for the most part, I don't. But people like Julia Barnes give me great optimism because she is so young and she's so smart. You know, she's only like 24, 25. <clears throat> Excuse me. And she's brilliant. And she, you know, I get letters sometimes from kids who are 17 and 18 who understand this issue so much better than a lot of us older people. And that that is something that gives me great optimism. Anyway, I just wanted to say how much I appreciate Julia. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, I want to also later ask you about Max and um, uh, uh, Leah Keith as well, um, Keith Leah. Uh, but in her documentary, she interviews David Suzuki. And David Suzuki has been you know, a hero of mine you know, since I was a kid. And he puts the question, and I think probably anybody who really takes on what you're saying around solar is going to come up with something similar to what he said, which is, we don't we need to be doing something? They have to do something. Are you suggesting we do nothing? You know, this is David Suzuki in, in praise of, you know, the big solar lie, you know, solar roads and, you know, people should wear solar on their backpacks and everything should be solar and we should catch every bit of sun uh, to try and move away from coal and gas. So let's, let's tuck into that, Derek, because that's the one I think where people go, oh, maybe, 
if we go solar, things will be okay. Everything's, you know, everything's horrible right now. We're going, you know, as you say, there's a collapse of, you know, about every known system, natural known system on the planet. Uh, so if we go solar, maybe we can mitigate that, but that's certainly not what you're saying. Okay, there's, there's a bunch of problems here. The first one is that so many of the, you know, the subtitle of the book is something like how the mainstream environmentalism lost its way. And what we're getting at with that is that the environmental movement has been captured. At one point, it was about protecting wild places and wild beings. And these days it has become about powering industrial civilization. And one example of this is you can have 100,000 people who march on the streets of New York or Boston or Paris or you know whatever city. And if you ask them why they're marching, they'll say, we wanna save the planet. And if you ask them for their demands, what they'll say is they want subsidies for the wind and solar industries. And that's an extraordinary coup. I cannot think of any other social movement in history that has been so completely captured and turned into a lobbying arm for a sector of industrial capitalism. That's terrifying. And part of the problem is that the modern environmentalists, so many of the mainstream, I'm not talking about grassroots environmentalists, and I'm not talking about individuals who might work for large environmental organizations. I'm talking about the organizations themselves. They say explicitly again and again that what they're about is, Bill McKibben says repeatedly, and this is not blaming Bill McKibben, Bill McKibben has done more work than anyone else, I think, to raise awareness of global warming. He has worked tirelessly and selflessly. I'm not attacking him as a human being, I just have a disagreement. And I've said this to him directly, that he says explicitly again and again that what he's trying to save is civilization. He's not trying to save wombats. He's not trying to save um, canyon wrens. He's not trying to save right whales. And same with Lester Brown, same with all these people. They say, we need to realize that what's at stake is civilization itself. And Naomi Klein, and we quote her in the book, says, um, polar bears just don't do it for us. Don't do it for me. That what does it for me? I mean, she says, it's really all about us. It's about saving us. And I think Aldo Leopold and John Muir certainly, and um, Rachel Carson, as Lier says in the book, um, Rachel Carson didn't save the birds so that her legatees would offer them up to wind turbines. Mm -hmm. And so it really is, you know, so many indigenous people have said to me over the decades, that the first and most important thing that we have to do is to decolonize our hearts and minds. And that word is thrown around a lot these days, but for me, basically that just means make your loyalty to the natural world. And if your loyalty is to the natural world, you will try to protect different things. So we say near the end of the book that this book has a lot of facts. We go on about facts and facts and facts and facts, but it's really about values. But the truth is that we value something different than they do. Mm. That we, you know, there, there are 35 Scottish wildcats left in the world. That's, that's a, a native cat, not a feral cat. It's a wildcat mm. in Scotland. And their habitat is now on the block to make a big wind farm. And we oppose that. We, we, so the first thing is our loyalty is to the natural world. And when you think about it, do desert tortoises really want for there to be solar panels put in on their home? No. Um, do, I just interviewed someone two nights ago from Tasmania who is fighting a uh, high power transmission line that's going in across a valley where they live to provide electricity from a wind energy harvesting facility to mainland Australia. And do the Tasmanian devils who happen to live there who do not have the virus yet, 
do they want this there? No. Uh, do right whales want uh, want barrages put across the Bay of Fundy? No. And when you, I mean, really all it is is about switching to a biocentric perspective. But okay, so let's put that aside for a moment. And then even with the solar, there are, even with solar itself, there are a bunch of problems. And one of them, of course, is that they require mining. Um, there's a plan that's out uh, that in a lot of environmentalists really love, put out by an engineer named Mark Jacobson, which calls for turning the entire energy supply of the United States, maybe the world, into uh, non-fossil fuel, into wind, solar, et cetera. And in order to put his plan in place, it would require one and a half times the total iron ore output for the entire world just to make the wind energy turbines. So more mining would be required. And in the United States, it would require the equivalent of building 12 new Hoover dams every day in terms of materials. And Lester Brown talks about how we need to have all this brand new infrastructure built. Again, ancient redwood trees don't need that. And years ago, I know I'm jumping around, but anybody who's read my books knows that's what I do. Um, um, you, do you do it well, years, Derek. Thank, Just keep thank you. Yep. Years ago, George Monbiot wrote this, uh, this essay um, and he had a, a line that really stuck with me, which is he was, the essay was in favor of nuclear and against solar. And his argument was that, um, that solar just won't work to run factories for reasons we can get into in a minute. And there was a line that really bothered me, which was um, the reason, you know, nuclear is reliable, wind and solar aren't for reasons we'll talk about in a second. And he said, how else are we going to get the energy that we need to run our brick factories? And I'm gonna change a couple words and it changes everything, which is instead of saying, how else are we going to get the energy that we need to run our brick factories? How else are the capitalists going to get the energy that they need to run their brick factories? It's not our brick factory, it's not my brick factory. It's not, it's not a hooping cranes factory, it's a capitalist factory. And so the ones who want the industrial levels of energy are the ones who want the industrial levels of energy. So the first off, there is the problem of solar requires tremendous mining. It requires rare earths mining. It devastates places all over the world. Second is that what will the energy be used for? Um, the other day, somebody was complaining about the book because they said, what about uh, Aboriginal people in Australia who don't have access to the grid, so you want to deny them having solar photovoltaics. And I thought her argument was pretty disingenuous, so I actually looked up the math because I'm a nerd. And in Australia, 22% of electricity is used for residential purposes. So right off the top, 78% is used for industry, mainly manufacturing and mining. So when somebody says it's gonna be used for an Aboriginal person's house, well, right off the top, we have 78% actually going to industry. Mm -hmm. And then the next part is I said, so what percentage of people in Australia are Aboriginals? And it's about 3%. So that 22%, 3% is used by Aboriginal people. And then I said, so what percentage, I looked up, it took me like five minutes to do all this, what percentage of Aboriginal people in Australia live in urban settings, which means that they probably have access to the grid already. And that was like, I don't remember the number, it was like 97%. So basically, and that's presuming that every, per, every rural Aboriginal person in Australia is not attached to the grid, it would still be 22% and then 3% of that, and then 20% of that, and that math is good. You see what I'm getting at, right? Yes, yeah, yeah. That she was actually sort of using them as human shields for what's actually gonna be used by, by 
agriculture and industry. So th this happens all the time. But they will say, the United States, this happens constantly. Oh, they want to put in a new dam and it will provide power for 500,000 homes. Well, actually, it's going to provide power mainly for um, Kaiser aluminum smelting. Mm. But they never talk about that. Mm. Anyway, so that's a problem is what are you going to use it for? But then there's another problem that we really need to talk about, which is, well, there's two other problems. One is it will never work. And it will never even work to continue to run the economy. And the reason is that wind and solar are variable. And so wind only works when the wind's blowing, solar only works during the day, and the industrial economy needs a very consistent source of power. So what this means is that in Germany, the largest physics organization has said, we basically replaced as much of as much fossil fuels as we can through solar because because of the intermittency problem. Um, and I hope people understand. So right now, excuse me, wind and solar are like two to three percent or four percent or five percent of total German electricity. It's a it's a trivial amount. And that's about all it can be because of the intermittency problem. And then there's another problem too, which is what I really wanted to get at with all this, which is something called the Jevons paradox, which people really need to understand, which is wind and solar don't replace fossil fuels yeah. anyway. Yes, yeah. And this is called the Jevons paradox after this guy Jevons in the 19th century, who was an economist who studied coal. And he asked, when you increase the efficiency in the use of coal, that should decrease coal demand, right? If you only need to use half as much to cook your dinner or heat your house or whatever, then that's 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 great. So you, you reduce the, use, the demand for, for coal. But he found it's completely wrong. But what happens is if you increase the efficiency with which coal is used, you find more uses for it. And especially capitalism uses it to find more uses. So for example, if a capitalist or an industrial, it doesn't matter. I mean, it would be the same under a communist society. It doesn't matter at all. If, if they have, if their coal bill is $1,000 a month and they find a way to cut that to 500 a month, instead of saving that money, they will probably expand their production so that now they're using just as much coal as they were before but they're using all sorts of other inputs too. And the same thing has happened on everything. It's not just coal, it's on houses. House efficiency has gone up by about, I think it's 50% in the last 40 or 50 years, but house size has increased by an almost identical amount. So we're using the same amount of energy. It's just, now we got bigger houses. And the same is true, they did a study and it's basically every material, every increase in efficiency of usage has led to an increase in the amount it's used. So what's happened over time is for the longest time, humans used, the, the energy they used primarily came from human and non-human slavery. That's like you, you put a, a cow or a horse in front of a plow or a mule in front of a plow, use that. Or before that, you put a human in front of a plow. Anyway, so human and non-human slavery and also wood. We used wood to cook, we used wood to heat. And then they figured out coal. And so wood use actually didn't go down. Coal just added. And then they found oil. And wood use and coal use did not go down. They just, oil just added on top. Then they added hydro. And coal use, wind, coal use, high, all the others did not go down. Every single time you add something new on, it just adds on. So the wind and solar <clears throat> have simply added I want to tell one more lie about this and then I'll shut up and you can ask me another question, which is another lie they tell all the time or quite often is they will say, I don't know if they do this in Australia, but in the United States it happens constantly in Germany it happens constantly. Los Angeles is going to go to hundred percent renewable energy. Uh, 50 cities across the United States are vowed to go to hundred percent renewable energy. Munich has gone vowed to go to hundred percent renewable energy. No, they have not. They didn't even promise to. They promised to go to 100% renewable electricity. And it's fine if your neighbor or my neighbor or me before I wrote the book or 
a neurosurgeon or a cricket player or a plumber doesn't know the difference between energy and electricity, but a reporter for the LA Times who works on the energy beat, who writes that article should be fired because electricity is only 20% of energy use. Los Angeles did not promise to stop using fossil fuels for transportation, for heating, for all sorts of other uses. And then when they talk about the, the um, even the 100% renewable pledge to 100% renewable electricity, which they call energy, um, a lot of that is really bogus too, because most of that seriously, like. 40% of the increase or whatever, the, the, the biggest increase in Germany, which has been called a miracle, has been from biomass, which is simply cutting down forests and burning them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, this is... And that's called carbon neutral, which is just a lie. This is... So the whole, thing is, the whole thing is bogus and it's accounting. And with the world at stake, I'm not, I'm not happy with bogus accounting. If we're going to, we're facing some of the most difficult problems humans have ever faced. And we need to not have boosterism and to, like, here's another thing that happens. It just annoys me very much is they'll say the other day, they got a hundred percent of their energy, the amount of electricity from wind and solar in Germany. And okay, first off they meant electricity, not energy. Second, they included the biomass. They make it sound like it's wind and solar, but they're including biomass and all the others. Third, this might've happened for one hour on a sunny, wind day, windy Sunday when demand is lower. And it happened for one hour and it happens literally less than 1% of the time. And they claim that this means, they'll actually say, this means we can power the economy on it. And um, and that's just, that's not the sort of discourse we should have when facing real problems. You know, it's like if I go to a doctor and I am have some horrible condition, I don't want them to say, did you not feel any pain from 3 to 4 a.m. last night when you were asleep? You know, yeah, I didn't feel any pain right then. Oh, well, then you must be fine. It's that, it's that level of, of insanity when we when we when you go to a doctor you want them to say here's the problem i have a good friend who's a doctor who always says the correct diagnosis is the first step toward proper treatment and <clears throat> if we are lying to ourselves about the condition which god knows on health conditions nobody ever lies to themselves about their condition as they smoke three packs a day as they're getting emphysema but nothing's wrong you know it's it's like let's You know, I want to start with a little bit of honesty. Okay, so now I'll, I'll shut up again and you can ask another question. You know, what you're saying leads to the point of the way this civilization operates is finished. It is finished already, actually. It ca can't keep going. But then, so there's two questions that come out of that. Um, how do we live in the world right now? Um, like I can't get out of bed without turning on the lights or getting in my car or it's impossible not to be caught up in this whole system. Um, almost everything that I do involves being caught up in the system. So, so we can talk about the system and how it's letting us down, um, but I'm in it. So, I mean, especially with someone with the clarity of your perspective, how do you, how do you live on a day-to-day -day level with this understanding? Well, thank you for asking that. And I have been fortunate enough to talk with some really wise people in my life, people far wiser than I. And I remember in my thirties, I was feeling just awful and feeling like, you know, car culture is my fault. It's my fault because I drive a car. Global warming is my fault because I drive a car. And an American Indian friend of mine, Jeanette Armstrong, Okanagan, uh, she said to me, she got really stern and she said, look, take responsibility for what you do, but you didn't create car culture. It's not your fault. 
So you need to work to take down car culture, but whether or not you drive is really irrelevant. And so that really helped me because yes, I, and here's another thing. <clears throat> Over the years, this doesn't happen so much anymore, but for a while from maybe 2001 to 2005, I had a lot of Buddhists get really mad at me, especially American Buddhists, <laughs> because they would say, you talk about how much you love the salmon, you need to learn detachment. You need to learn to let them go. Oof. And yeah, exactly. That would make me so angry. And then it's like, you need to let go of your anger. And um, I realized that they had it wrong that no, we shouldn't just, you should never get detached from atrocities. You should never uh, say, well, salmon are here and that's fine, but if they go, it's just the blinking of God's eyebrow or something. But where the detachment really works is with things like car culture. Yeah, car culture exists and I got a car and you know, I'm going to drive to the grocery store tomorrow. But when car culture goes, I'm not going to get I'm not attached to car culture. And that's one of the ways I think we live in this society is to recognize that you didn't make the society, I didn't make the society, and we need to work to bring it down. We need to work to defend wild nature in whatever ways we can using whatever tools are necessary. You know, people have gotten mad. Gosh, Derek, you write books and they're published on the flesh of trees and therefore I can ignore everything you say. It's like, what, we're supposed to take down industrial capitalism and do it without using any, any tools whatsoever? Mm. I mean, that's just nuts. But I don't think that the people who come after are gonna much care whether you were pure, whether I was pure, whether we drove, whether we didn't drive, whether we recycled, whether we voted green or Democrat or Republican or whatever they are in Australia, they're not gonna care about that. What they're gonna care about is whether they can breathe the air and drink the water. Mm. What they're gonna care about is whether the land can support them. And so that's the framework in which I look at how to live mm. is how do I live such that the world is a better place. The world, not, not the economy. That's part of the problem too, is that, <clears throat> excuse me, when I say, when I used to give talks at colleges, if I asked a student, what are you gonna do when you get out in the real world? What that meant to them was, what are you gonna do when you have to get a job? Yes. For most of us, that's the real world. But we need to remember that the real world is soil and the real world is water and the real world is trees. So we need to, 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 in our lives, to prioritize that and to ask, is the world a better place because of this? And that has to do with the bright green stuff. Is the world, by which I mean the physical world, I mean the natural world, is the world a better place because a solar facility went in? Not is your life easier, not did it provide more electricity so that even for, and I'm not gonna pick an easy example like mining or manufacturing, but even, even so that it can run a hospital. You know, I'm not, is the, re, is the physical world a, a better place because of that? And that's how we need to, to ask it. And this goes way back. You know, you mentioned civilization. I mentioned civilization. And one of the sort of jokes I've told for a long time is, is that they say one sign of intelligence is the ability to recognize patterns. Well, I'm gonna lay out a pattern. Let's see if we can recognize it in less than 6,000 years. And that's when you think of Iraq is the first thing you think of cedar forest so thick that sunlight never touched the ground. No, of course not. The first written myth of Western civilization is Gilgamesh deforesting the hills and valleys of Iraq to make a great city. And the Arabian Peninsula was an oak savanna and those were cut down. The Near East was heavily forested. Those were cut down. North Africa was heavily forced. That was cut down to make the Egyptian and Phoenician Navy. I, navies. I got a, a note a couple of years ago from somebody in on a Mediterranean island who said, my God, I've lived here my whole life. And I always thought that these are supposed to be rocky islands. And then I looked at the prehistory 
And these are supposed to be covered with ancient huge trees. This is supposed to be heavily forested. And you know, there were great auks. Uh, there were penguins in the Northern hemisphere. They were called great auks. They, were, they weren't related to penguins, but they, but they fulfilled the same ecological role. There were walruses, walruses in the English Channel um, until about 1300 years ago. And you know, there were herds of bison. You know, we can talk about this no matter what continent you're on. I mean, it doesn't take a cognitive giant. See, that's where I, I first understood the problem when I was in second grade and I didn't have the language, but when I was in second grade, they put in a subdivision right next to where I lived. And I remember thinking, where will the garter snakes go? And where will the grasshoppers go? And where will the meadowlarks go? That's the language I did have. The language I didn't have is you can have infinite growth on a finite planet. Mm -hmm. And so someday, all of my work can be summed up by someday this culture will end. And when it ends, I would rather that there's more of the world left rather than less. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I try to live my life. Mm -hmm. And if you need to use a computer to try to stop a pipeline or to try to stop a solar installation or to try to stop a war, you know, or to do whatever it is that, that you are going to try to do, then I, I don't care. I mean, I, I don't, and I don't think the people who come after are going to care. What they're going to care about is whether there are trees on that piece of land. And so that's part of how we live. Um, was that what you were asking? Yeah, no, it was there. That, that was a great answer. I mean, I, 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 one of the things that happens when I'm talking or reading or watching you, Derek, is um, that, I, that my focus gets very sharp around this. And I realized that, you know, that whole anthropocentric kind of position that I don't think that I hold that strongly. When I'm talking to you, I really do recognize how strongly I'm holding it. And all these solutions uh, are only solutions to keep the human, the human project going in the way that it's been going. They're not solutions for the planet itself. But it brings the question to mind, which is, you know, I think part of the work that I do um, in this field is really focus on helping people to open to the grief of of what we're in and what we're losing and what we're also facing as humanity. I mean, I I wonder, like, if you see so clearly what's coming, how do you live with the the coming demise of this culture? Uh, you know, very on the cards, we're looking at human extinction here. So how do you go about facing that? Well, honestly, I don't mind the end of this culture, um, even though I fully recognize that it will make it so you know, I don't know, I can no longer, I will no longer have an electric blanket. And I love me my electric blanket. Um, you know, I, I wanna be really clear that I love watching baseball games and, you know, I like watching good movies. I'm, I just, you know, I'm, I just also recognize that this way of life can't last. And so, and, you know, I get annoyed as everybody else. It's pretty funny. When the internet goes out, <laughs> when the internet goes out, it's I have the same response every time, which is for like the first 15 minutes, I'm just mad and like, oh my God, how could they get rid of my, how could this happen? This is terrible. It's destroyed my day. And then after about 15 minutes, it's like, huh, maybe I go for a walk, you know? And then I just go and sit outside and then, I come in an hour later, it's like, oh good, the internet's not back on yet. And then three hours later when the internet comes back on, it's like, at first I'm like, oh crap. And then five minutes later, of course, I'm looking on ESPN to see what happened in the baseball games. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm as addicted as the next person and I fully acknowledge that. But, um, but so far as the grief, um, <clears throat> my main grief that I feel, which is unquenchable, is is for 
for the, the what's happening to wild nature. Mm -hmm. And I feel like right now uh, in the car, I'm listening to a book written by the guy who wrote Downton Abbey. And the book is set in the 1830s. And whenever I read a book that's set in the 1830s or I read a book that's written in the 1830s, I feel tremendous envy, which is something I don't normally feel. I don't really have the envy gene, but I feel tremendous envy because in 1830, the runs of salmon were still huge mm -hmm. and they still had a world that was full. Mm -hmm. And the same thing will happen with, I just finished reading a biography of Ross McDonald, the mystery writer who died in 1983. And there were some pictures of him bird watching in 1962 or something. And it's like, there were a lot more birds then. And so I do feel some bitterness over that. But there's another point I want to get to that I think is really important, which is, so years ago, I, uh, in the 90s, I'd been an activist for five or six years. And I was just breaking down, crying, sobbing every couple, three times a week over the murder of the planet. And a lot of my environmental friends said, God, Derek, you need to take some time off because the problems to be there when you come back. So just take some time off, come back and you'll feel better. But I knew that that wasn't right because I knew if you're not going to cry about the death of the salmon, what are you going to cry about? I knew that just taking a vacation wasn't, wasn't the answer. And then one day I was sobbing and I called Jeanette Armstrong, whom I mentioned already. And I said, you know, this work is killing me. It's breaking my heart. And she said, yeah, it'll do that. And I said, the dominant culture hates everything, doesn't it? She said, yeah, it does, even itself. I said, um, unless it's stopped, it's going to kill everything on the planet, isn't it? She said, yeah, it is, unless it's stopped. And I said, we're not going to make it some great new glorious tomorrow, are we? And she said the best thing she could possibly say, which is, I've been waiting for you to say that. And the reason that was the best thing she could say is because it normalized my despair. Mm -hmm. And let me know that despair is an appropriate response to a desperate situation. Mm -hmm. And so many environmentalists, especially, spend so much energy trying to avoid feeling mm -hmm. all of this sorrow. When if you just feel it, you feel it, you know, it's just another feeling and you can feel it and it won't kill you. Mm -hmm. And you can feel it and it will kill you. And that's even better because once you're dead, they can't touch you. And by dead, in this case, I don't mean, you know, dead, dead, like cut your throat. I mean, once you give up on the false hope that they are going to change, then you can start to see things a lot more clearly. And you can still sing and you can still dance. And you can still make love and you can still fight like hell, but they can't touch you anymore because because you see the system for what it is. So for me, going through that process of grief, okay, it's really, really important to me at least that I not get stuck there because the point is not the grief I feel over the murder of the planet. The point is the murder of the planet because if the point really is, if I get stuck just at, oh, I, I mean, look at this, look at this, you, Somebody, somebody, you get in a car wreck and you get a broken neck. And now I'm like, oh my God, I feel so terrible because he has a broken neck. That's so terrible. How will I deal with my pain over him? It's like, you're the one with a broken neck. <laughs> like, I'm not the one who's primarily suffering. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think the grief is really important. And people ask me sometimes how I motivate myself. And one is I really like what I do. I just love writing and I love this sort of analysis. I love these conversations. I love figuring out, trying to figure out temporary answers to things. And also whenever I feel, whenever I get too discouraged, whenever I get too down, I just think, you know, I can turn away. I can stop and watch a baseball game and the 35 Scottish wildcats can't turn away from the habitat destruction. So I think the grief is incredibly important to feel. And I think it's really easy to 
allow that grief to paralyze you. And I think it's even okay if the grief paralyzes you for a while. But then, you know, my mom really taught me, I mean, the broken neck thing came from her. She broke her neck horribly in a car wreck. And she used to tell me all the time, so if you make a mistake, you know, if you make some terrible mistake that harms yourself or somebody else, it's like, okay, be yourself up for five minutes and then go fix it. Mm-hmm. And so I, I think it's really important to feel these things and then to get up and dust off our pants and get back into the fight. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can't, I want to be really clear that, that one of the reasons that I'm so prolific is because I spent my 20s in one sense doing nothing. And I said that to Terry Tempest Williams one time and she got upset at me and said, you weren't doing nothing, you were preparing. And that's absolutely true. So one of the reasons I'm so prolific is because I have taken the time to grieve. I have to, and it's not grieving so that I can get past the grieving because as you know, from any work on grief, if you grieve with an eye toward getting over the grief, you're not really grieving. Yeah. Yeah. You're, you're faking it and you're doing a, a phony. I mean, you have, for me, at least I had to just fall into it. And I loved what you said, you know, which you really clarified in my mind um, through that book and the documentary. I think people confuse fighting for the natural world with fighting for solar power or fighting for, you know, hydropower or green cities. We've really gotten messed up on that, on that angle. We've really lost focus, but you know, you've already spoken about that already. I'm just sort of reiterating a point there. Well, it horrifies me that, I mean, environmentalists were supposed to be the people who spoke for the world Mm. and I mean, it, it's the cliche, but it's really true. I mean, who speaks for wolf? Who speaks for salmon? And somebody's got to do it because, well, the, the, actually, honestly, the wolves and the salmon are doing it, but nobody's listening. Mm-hmm. And, um, and again, dams do not help rivers. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Here's another image that, that, that I love that, that came to me many years ago. I'll tell you the story. I love this story. So... For a while, I was talking about blowing up dams, and this hydrologist one time at a talk said, no, that's terrible. It's the worst thing that can happen to a river. Never, ever say that people should blow up a dam because that actually harms rivers. And so I didn't know. So I called up some fisheries biologists and hydrologists, and it was so funny. I'd call them up and say, hey, um, I'm just wondering, if somebody blows up a dam, will that harm the river? Click. Like, hello? Hello? And they wouldn't answer the question, of course, because they thought I was a loony who was going to, you know, go buy some fertilizer and blow up a dam. And so then I figured out another way to ask it, which is, (laughs) so let's pretend it's 100 years from now and the grid has collapsed and electricity is no longer required. And people in your community come to you and ask, would it be better to remove the dam all at once by blowing it up? Or would it be better to allow it to remain and eventually fail because all dams eventually fail? What would be better? And every hydrologist and fisheries person was going, blow it up, blow it up, blow it up. When you allowed them, when you gave them the room to know that you know, they weren't gonna get a, a visit from the FBI the next day. And one of them said this beautiful thing to me. She said, I mean, they all just said, basically a dam coming down is a big flood. That's all it is. And there was the Missoula flood on the Columbia River that uh, was 12,000 years ago, it was like 90% of the entire freshwater flow in the world was down the Columbia for a while. I don't remember the numbers, but it was like 100 feet high and 60 miles an hour, uh, carrying boulders the size of rocks all the way across Washington um, during the last ice age. Anyway, and the salmon and sturgeon survived that, but they're not surviving the dams. And other people said, you know, dams, dams form all the time on rivers and they fail all the time. Naturally, you'll get a rock slide, you'll get lava flow. The problem is that there's dams on more or less every river. One dam on one river doesn't matter, it happens. But then this one woman said this amazing thing. She said she works on a free flowing river, no dams, and she loves this river. 
And every time it floods, she said, we misdefine rivers because we believe that rivers are stationary, but they're not. She said, they writhe like snakes across the landscape. Every season they'll flood and make a new channel. And she said, every time it floods, it breaks her heart because of all the deer, trees, fish, frogs who die. It's, you know, it's horribly violent, it's terrible. But every time it floods, it makes her ecstatic because every time it floods, it is, and this is the phrase that is the point of this whole story, short-term habitat loss and long-term habitat gain. And when she said that, it was like a slap in the face because I thought, why do we stay in bad relationships? Because we're afraid of short-term habitat loss for the long-term habitat gain. Why do we stay in jobs we hate? Short-term habitat loss, long-term habitat gain. Why do we, why do we not, why do we come up with all these false solutions that will, and our attempts to keep civilization going just a little bit longer at the expense of the world, short-term habitat loss, long-term habitat gain. And this happens in our private lives constantly. You know, we, we, we do anything we can to put off that reckoning, even if the reckoning is going to be much worse when it comes later. And, <clears throat> excuse me. So again, all of my work is really just about, oh, so I don't read reviews of my work. I used to when I was younger and I found it's a terrible idea, but there was one thing what somebody said in one review that I really liked, which is they said that they found me almost pathologically unsentimental. And if they would have said almost pathologically unemotional, I would have been really insulted. But unsentimental means, what that means to me is that I try to look as clearly as I can and I try to tell the truth no matter the consequences. It doesn't mean we have to follow through on necessarily this truth, but we should at least know our options. Yes. I'm a big believer in knowing options. Yes. And so we should know that dams, yes, they kill rivers. Yes, they kill an adrenous fish. Mm. Yes, they do. All, they kill silt down below. They don't allow silt to go through, which causes all sorts of problems. And in addition, countries count themselves as carbon neutral because of dams, but dams actually are called methane bombs by people who know because they produce so much methane, they're actually produced one and a half times the greenhouse gases of burning coal. Mm which doesn't mean I'm suggesting burning coal. It means I'm just selling, let's tell the truth about hydro. Yeah. So Costa Rica is not carbon neutral. Mm. And so I, I just fully believe, I mean, I have Crohn's disease. And when the doctor came in to tell me after the biopsy that revealed it, he just walked in and said, so I'm sorry, the biopsy showed you have Crohn's disease. And then he left, let me cry for a couple hours and then came back and mm. let's talk about options. And it's the same here. Civilization is not sustainable. It has never been sustainable. It will never be sustainable. So, okay. And if you want to grieve that, grieve that, that's fine. But whether I did or did not grieve the fact that I had Crohn's disease did not matter. The disease doesn't care if I grieve it or not. Yes, it was important for me to grieve it. And he acted absolutely appropriately by giving me a couple hours to, instead of just lashing out, you know, give me a couple hours to sort of compose myself. And now let's talk options. Yeah. Um, is that making sense? Yeah, no, it totally makes sense. I mean, that's it. I mean, I, I, I you know, you know, when you talk about uh, what you do in your book solutions, because maybe there's people asking that questions now, well, what are the solutions? I, I loved your solutions. Um, you know, one of them was just to stop all logging now stop burning gas fuels like that there is obvious solutions but the consequences of those solutions mean that the civilization that we're in ends and that i think is what we're looking at really there is solutions for uh i, I don't want to save the planet but for, for protecting what's left of the planet there are solutions but it's at the cost of humanity well, the cost of civilization, because long-term long -term humanity, I mean, if this way of life, as you said earlier, we could very well go extinct, and I don't disagree. So I'm not sure that civilization is actually serving us. Yes, it's making it so we have access to ice cream 24-7, <sighs> but 
is it actually serving us in the long term? Mm -hmm. And when you look at rates of addiction and everything else, mm -hmm. rates of happiness, rates of narcissism, mm -hmm. the point is that there are ways in which it is not served. That's another question we have to ask. How is civilization serving us well? How is it not serving us well? Mm -hmm. And those are questions we need to ask and answer honestly. Mm -hmm. But anyway, back to the original point, one of the complaints people have had about the book, which cracks us up, is they say they don't pre present any solutions. <laughs> That's not true. It's just you don't like our solutions. It doesn't mean they're not solutions. Yeah, they're not and solutions even, that, that take care of the culture as we've known it, put it that way. Well, and part of the thing, too, is that the even maintaining, yes, yes. Okay, here's the thing. If somebody made me the, uh, the dictator of the world, I would not shut down civilization overnight. I would actually have a, a soft landing. I would attempt to use the energy that we have, like some of the fossil fuels we have to, like the first thing I would do is get rid of retractable stadium roofs, stadium roofs you know, get rid of golf courses, get rid of all the stuff that is just completely luxuries we don't need. And then I would, I would throttle down. And of course I would last about five minutes before I got killed. Um, but the but the, the point I want to get to is that <clears throat> even maintaining this culture, which again I don't want to do, there are things that could be done that sequester tons of carbon. They talk about, oh, that we have this great carbon sequestration scheme where we're going to pump it underground, which causes all sorts of other problems. But if you just re if the United States restored all of the prairie east of the Mississippi, that doesn't even include the Great Plains. All the prairie east of the Mississippi, it would uh, turn the United States, even as it is, into a net carbon sink. Mm. The natural world has a tremendous capacity for sequestering carbon. If you, but the thing is, a, it doesn't make money. B, it means that you let that land alone, and not only land, but also seagrass beds, um, mangrove swamps, mm. peat bogs. They have a tremendous capacity for, okay, I think about the, here's something I hate. When people say, oh, the earth is going to be fine. You know, we're just hurting it a little bit and it's gonna be fine. No, it's like a body in that the body is miraculous that if I get a cut, I cut myself shaving the other day, I don't know if you can see it. And I didn't do anything, it just healed itself. The body has, a, it's right here. The body has a tremendous capacity for self-regeneration. You know, I'm sure at some point in your life you've broken an arm or you've you've had a bad cut somewhere. And, you know, four months later, boop, you know, the cut's all gone. And it's the same with nature, that if you only push it so far, it can regenerate miraculously. But if you push it too far, it's gone. And And the stakes are much too high for us to be doing these open air experiments. But anyway, the point is that there are plenty of things that we could do and we suggest in the book that don't even mean you can't have access to ice cream for a while. Mm -hmm. And just they, they include restoring forests, restoring prairies, restoring. And that doesn't mean planting random trees. It means finding out who lives there and then, and then helping them to come back. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, it means getting out of the way letting go of control and letting them do it. Mm -hmm. Nature always knows better than we do. Mm -hmm. And that is probably the, the line to, to end on, Derek. And I, I've just so enjoyed talking with you. I, I feel like um, if you live closer, I could probably sit with you for three or four hours and, and, um, and want to come back the next day and do it again. So um, Thank you so much. Thank you so much for your work, Derek. And thank you for bringing the perspective that you do and the change that that brings to people. And may it spread and um, may your work be recognized in the way that it should. Well, thank you so much for saying that. And if you want to do another one, let's, let's do another interview. Brilliant. Great. Love to. <laughs>